that's mostly what I worked on. The, these, the burrowing ones, you have to dig around in the mud and you can find brittle stars that have really long, skinny arms. Yeah, I and, see those. And uh, they basically bury and put their arms up on the surface. And in places like the Netherlands, they're heavily fed upon by flatfish. And, and so they're kind of like, you know, the life history strategy of grass is that it puts those blades up and they get grazed, but all the nutrients are in their roots and are down deep in the, unless they get pulled out, they're just regenerating their leaves all the time. And that's what these brittle stars are doing. It turns out they're regenerating their arms all the time. And what I found out was in areas like this, it's not fish that are feeding on them, it's crabs and crustaceans. And you know, these little hermit crabs, you know how abundant they are. There's millions of little Pagurus longicarpus and, and they'll just take an arm and it's, it's like a cartoon of, of uh, things eating corn, you know, they're, and they'll just, you'll see the arm go in and the ossicles come out clean, you know, and they'll regenerate those little arm tips in a couple of days. Then I found out that if you, so all our goodies are in this central disc area. And on the, on the burrowing kinds, it's almost like a mushroom cap. And um, I found out that if you bothered them, they would throw that disc top off. It would leave an oral skeletal frame with the nerve ring and everything, but it would throw away its gut and its gonads. And there aren't many animals that throw their gonads away. So that has real life history implications that either you've already bred or you're going to get them back. So we started doing research. We could actually get these animals to bury in cores and then we could take the cores back out and put them in the field and come back and they're very sedentary. We could collect the same animals back. And we found out that they can regenerate a gut in 13 days in the summertime and they'll regenerate their gonads over a summer season. So if, if they lose their, their disc in April, they're still ready to play in the final party in September. That's insane. And yeah. that, so the brown ones that we find in the mud, like when we pull up the clam bags, these are those ones? I'd have to look at them. Okay. Are they, it depends on how, are their arms really long and skinny? Yeah, yeah if they're big enough, then yeah. they're, they're, you'll have that central disc and then their arms can be like, this yeah, this and then when you're dredging and when you're, you'll get brittle stars that the, the disc is very much more connected to the arms. The big green ones, green and brown ones, they're found on the grass flats. And that's a different, entirely different group. But are they, you said the arms at the surface, so are they using the modified spines on their arms to bring oh, they food? Do a, and, they do a bunch of things. Mostly it's tube feet. They use their tube feet to pick up particulate uh, material and bring it down. But there's one species um, that actually has hemoglobin, so its tube feet are red. It's beautiful, beautiful, and it's planktivorous. I've got movies of it putting brine shrimp into an aquarium, and it sweeps its arm through and just cleans out all the brine shrimp wow. and passes them down. So some of them are probably planktivores, too. Interesting. That is really interesting. So they allow something to graze on them, and there's, is there anything that will pull them up out of the bottom? Um, well, the only thing we found, uh, a, f a friend of mine in South Florida found a lot of discs in the guts of juvenile stingrays. Mm. So we actually said, oh, well, maybe that's what's causing it. We made a, a stingray out of a, we took a bath mat and cut it in stingray size and put it pole on top of it and went down and tried to operate like a stingray and sampled beside it and where we'd been and the animals where we'd made that operation had lost their discs but not the rest of them so maybe it's a strategy if you lose the disc which has all the goodies in it anyway and also provides the strongest um, what do I want to say the, um, provides the strongest resistance to water currents. If you lose it, then maybe you can keep the rest of your body down there without getting washed out. Uh -huh. And so I tried to do that in the lab, putting them in cores and with plungers and things, and I never got it to work. They would never release their discs. 
but if you put them in a sieve and they'll run around, water run across them, they'll lose their disc. If you pull on it with the tweezers, they'll throw it off. It's called autotomy, self, self breakage. So that, that whole group is called the amphiurids, and they all sort of have that lifestyle and they all can autotomize their discs. Lots of other brittle stars that we have out here will not, they'll lose their arms, but they won't lose their disc like that. Interesting. And there's probably 12 to 15 species of brittle stars out here, wow. just in, the, in this area. You might, if you ever get sponges, you might see a brittle star that has real spiny arms, look like glassy spines. And that's a species called Ophiothrix. And that's what I was getting in this creek in the sponges. In that lagoon? Yeah, yeah. And then there's guys that live on the grass flats. And then there's another one. That, there's a channel just this side of Snake Key. And it's real shelly. And um, in that channel, you get a, you get a different species called Ophiolepis. It's real pretty. It's got scales on top of it. It's a real pretty species. Then in starfish, on the grass flats, there are two starfish you see really often. And one of them is orange and has little silver lines going down it. And one of them is dark purple with yellow dots on it. Um, and then out here in, this, in the channels, there's yet another one. Its name is Luidia clothrata, and it's tricolored. It's a real pretty, um, big starfish, and it eats echinoderms and and also eats um, polychaetes and clams. And it's a very, it's a sand dweller, so it doesn't have suckers on its tube feet. Its tube feet are different, and it's really fast. And I was doing an experiment once, and I touched a brittle star with the starfish. And the brittle star just took off running like mad. And I, one, so I let, had a camera, a Super 8 camera, and um, I had like 40 brittle stars in an aquarium, and I put a Luidia in. And it was like Godzilla and the fleeing villagers, you know, they all just kept running around and running around, and the starfish were running around. Next morning, he had eaten all 40 of them. You know, so then I started doing experiments and having students do experiments to figure out what they were sensing. And we, I've got an old movie that I've taken the echinaster, the guys from the grass flats, and I've got a brittle star sitting there, and I touch it with an echinaster, the brittle star doesn't do anything. Touch it with a finger, it doesn't do anything. Touch it with a luidia, and it takes off as fast as it can. So then we started, see, you, can, you know what a wide choice tube is? You, you have water flowing through a channel like that, and you can put two different chemicals, and if something's attracted to them, you can, it'll go toward the chemical. Um, and you can also set it up so they run away. And we would take water that Luidia had been in. They didn't react. They only reacted to the touch. So that's the point at which I hit the wall because then you have to take tube feet and chemically grind them up and chemically analyze them and see what chemicals they're sensing. But I'm sure it's a chemical that is bound to the membrane so that it has to be touched before the animal. And all of them, all these brittle stars and sea urchins too, boy, you touch them with a luidia and they take off. And in most parts of the world, there are two to three species of luidia and always one of them is an echinoderm predator and the other one eats clams and polychaetes more. Interesting. Yeah, it's really pretty neat stuff. It is very neat stuff. Yeah. <laughs> way, back, way back when, this dock area was just like it is now, except it was cement. And it, it was just as long as it is now, but it was cement and a lot of the cement had caved in. So sometime they have completely rebuilt the dock. But this is where we would come in. We had a very tiny dock out there, and we would come in, and this is where we'd anchor our boats. And uh, this dock did not exist then. It's no, that dock, dock did not exist. That's been added. Right. So when I brought my my tubs of brill stars over, I would sit on a chair right there in the intertidal zone, and sort sort those tubs. Um, Tom Rudiger uh, used to the juvenile uh, ibises. 
would come right down here and they'd feed along here and he used to sit here for hours and so they were watch feeding them. on fiddler crabs probably. yeah watch them yeah because yeah. uh, because that part of his and one of the things they found out about the ibises in fact was the adults would fly up to the Suwannee River and inland and then they would come back and feed the young until a certain stage because the young couldn't handle the salinity of the food until they got older and so they first would feed them stuff crayfish and things they got in the fresh waters and then they eventually switched and you'd see herds of young ibis feeding on fiddler crabs and things like that and this uh this whole platform was not there it didn't exist at all um, but there were some sheds and then there was this one laboratory and a very small shed but none of these nice wet tables at, at that time no i can the old there's an old marine railway i can remember occasionally they'd pull the uh, urchin out yep if they had to work on the uh, hull or something like that i still it's it's, it's still there i mean it's, it's really there. oyster yep. encrusted but i don't know if it's in use or not yeah i don't either but this was uh, now they've got a nice big mower but this was pretty overgrown back then uh, and I guess Kenny had showed you earlier there was a, a cart on a cable so you could if you really had a lot of heavy stuff or gas cylinders and things like that they would fire up the the, the motor and they would take heavy stuff up on the cart yeah just a long cable that came, yep. came down there and AD would load the uh, gas cylinders up and haul them up the hill but somebody had to be by the cart to keep it on, on the sidewalk yeah. <laughs> two-person operation yeah. yeah but that building was there and that I spent a lot of time in that building especially in the winter time because I once I sorted the brittle stars out of the sediment many of them looked very similar and I'd have a scope in there and I could sort them to species um, in there and uh, eventually we got a generator so we actually had light in there and didn't have to do it by a lantern Okay, let's go on in the building. Yeah, now, Steve, this shed was quite a bit smaller. I mean, maybe oh, like one, two, three, no more than probably four posts yeah, out I, here. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, right. and so all this has been added in uh, a while back. And I think those uh, saltwater tables, they weren't here when we had the Maturo reunion, I don't think. Nope, I don't think so either. These tubs were here when we had the Maturo reunion. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think we even had some tubs out here Boy, I can't remember. And and the, all that pump apparatus to bring water in is new and different. And this was always where AD and Lee and everybody, this was their work area. We almost never went in there. You know, we were out here, but that was where they did all their repairs and things like that. This is fairly unchanged from, I think there were some tables in here um, and there were some water tables just like this. I think these have been replaced, these are newer. But there were water tables, so if you did collect animals to take back to Gainesville or something, you could hold them overnight in these, these water tables. And there was a pump that pumped water up to a, the tank and then you'd have gravity fed water. And then later, when Frank started teaching summer courses, of course, they had really set this up as a classroom. So they would give lectures, and they had projectors for PowerPoints and things like that, but that didn't start until after, the, after I was gone. So you said when you were first doing work in here, you had to do work by lantern? Mm-hmm. So there wasn't ele electricity? Mm-hmm. And so I would have a lantern, yeah, it was pretty primitive. I had a, a dissecting scope, a dissecting microscope, and I would put the lantern by it for, for light and have to sort my brittle stars. Then later on, when we got the generator, I could fire up the generator and turn a microscope light on. That made it a whole lot easier. And then we only ran the generator when we really had to. Never ran it all night. So. 
when you finished your work, you'd close up and walk up, shut off the generator, and go up to the house. So yeah. at that time, the generator, was it just for the lab, or did it also service the house? Or the lighthouse, I mean? It didn't service the lighthouse. Just for down here for the Right. Lab. The lighthouse has since been completely wired. Yeah. But the generator, did, I don't think it serviced the house, did it? I, I, certainly not the first one. No, I don't think so. I mean, those were diesel generators, so of course you had uh, five five gallon jerry cans, and uh, you know we get tired of hauling them up the hill to fuel the right. generators that we didn't use it anymore, and we absolutely had to. Right, and I don't know if it lit up. I think we had mostly kerosene light up up there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we just had lanterns up, up yeah. at the lighthouse. And it was, I think, I don't think it ever got wired while I was here, and I left in seventy. Four, 74. But when we came back, of course, it had completely changed. And I think since Kenny has come, they've done a, a lot of additional work. Like you said, all the fire things are now uh, wired in. We, we didn't have anything like a, a, a even a battery smoke alarm. Smoke yeah, alarm. <laughs> Nothing close to that in, in the house. But there were just the, the bunks up there are are new, but Frank had gone to Blanding and gotten lots and lots of bunks. So we there were just as many beds, pretty much. They were just a lot older, Old and military more style, older double and beat double up. bunk yeah. beds. Yeah, yeah. And we cooked in the south kitchen. Even when AD wasn't there, we pretty much used the southern, the south end. Yeah, the the, the time that we spent out here, AD was on the other end. Uh, on the uh, west end, but even I this building has been this building has been really renovated nicely. It looks good. There's a nice diagram of seahorse here, or a picture, an aerial picture of seahorse. And we were talking yesterday. Here's the channel. Here's the harbor, and here's the channel going into that lagoon. And you can see it's a little deeper water there. That's where the sponges were that I collected my brittle stars. So I had a station there for one species and station here both in the di see the diplanthera zone, see this little narrow area and then it turns the turtle grass. So you've got two you've got bare sand, then you've got diplanthera, then you've got turtle grass. And so I had stations out here and as well as there cuz there were different species. And then uh, two more stations, one at Grassy Cove or Grassy Key, and one in Goose Cove over by the airport. But there were pelicans nesting, let me see, all down this way there were pelicans. And then the ibis would be up around the lighthouse in this area, and there were herons and frigate birds and all kinds of other birds out here. But we never went out there because we were all completely marine oriented and we knew there were lots of snakes. so. Um, we didn't just mess around very much out here. We came out and worked and went back. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so the story I wanted to tell about the mosquitoes was one summer, there was a group at the University of Florida that was testing the idea that they could get rid of mosquitoes by releasing sterilized males. And they needed a place where there was that was isolated and they picked this island. So one summer there was a guy that worked for the army, had been in the army, but I guess he was in USDA, and then the scientist, and they released tons of mosquitoes out here, including sterilized males, but also females. And they said they only fed on birds, which wasn't true. And there were mosquitoes everywhere but the guy with the army was really colorful and he loved to talk. And he had been assigned to test mosquito repellents for the army. And they would take him to a place in a salt marsh and they would put a repellent on half of him and not on the other half and then watch what the mosquitoes did. And he was totally unbothered by mosquito bites. He'd been bitten so much that he never even noticed them. And, it, and the experiment worked here. 
the sterilized males eventually reduced the population of that species of mosquito. And then the winter came and they died anyway. Then they went and tried it in India. And in India it didn't work because it wasn't isolated enough. There were too many reservoir populations that could keep sending fertile males back into the population. But that was the kind, that was a really neat experiment that was done on this island. I d doubt if anybody knows about it anymore.